All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this session of the Alliance for Community Trees webcast. This session is now being recorded and we are ready to roll. We have a wonderful presentation for you today with two expert speakers. Uh, to begin, you should know that the Alliance for Community Trees webcast series is a monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. These trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience to model organizations, methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives, each for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers from the audience. Uh, most state landscape architecture boards require only a certificate of completion uh, for, to get credit for having attended this session, so if you'd like that, we can provide one. Please email us after the session. You should also know that this session is approved by the International Society of Arboriculture for one unit of CEU credit and also approved by the Society of American Foresters, SAF, for one unit of CFE credit. Uh, you entered your membership numbers when you registered and you will be automatically um, accredited for having attended this session. But if you have any questions, feel free to shoot us an email after the session and we'll make sure that you get your CEUs. This is a program of Alliance for Community Trees. Please consider joining if you are not already a member. We're a national network of local organizations, nonprofits, and city governments working to improve communities by planting, caring, and educating about trees. Today's session has a lot of uh, excitement and a lot of relevance to people all across the country. It's riparian tree planting for healthy watersheds. As communities shoulder greater concern over water resources in urban areas, preserving natural buffer zones is a top priority. Riparian tree planting programs can help address pollution, erosion, flooding, water temperature, and litter issues along riverbanks. While riparian tree planting can pose challenges and methods and conditions vary from city to city, the outcome is clear. Trees are critical for healthy watersheds. And we're lucky today to have two expert speakers uh, from different parts of the country to address uh, the riparian work that they do uh, in their cities and regions, uh, Sue Probart and Chuck Connor. We're going to start off today with Sue Probart, who is the executive director of Trees New Mexico. Uh, a nonprofit organization that she has guided into a nationally recognized and commended environmental tree planting and educational group. Sue currently serves as a founding board member of Alliance for Community Trees, WHO, uh, and the New Mexico Tree Planting Advisory Committee, the Savory Institute, and the New Mexico Urban Forest Council. Sue also helped Navajo agencies and government officials establish Navajo Nation Arbor Day and assist other communities in earning their Tree City USA designations. Sue has uh, wide knowledge of the field and we are so excited to have you with us today. Thanks so much, Sue. Take it away. Thank you, Leland. Um, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the country. Um, I'd like to start off with just an overview here of, of the Albuquerque Rio Grande Bosque. Um, there, it, through, running through Albuquerque is a 22-mile swath of the Rio Grande running through the heart of the city. Um, this area consists of about 4,000 land and water acres with uh, 2,500 of them being wooded acres and it is the largest cottonwood willow gallery in North America. Um, the conditions that we have now and some of the obstacles that you can see here are, um, for one thing, as, as the river had become channeled in the 50s, jetty jacks and channels and levees and dams really changed the Rio Grande from a free-flowing river to basically a, a channeled, a piece of channeled river. Um, even though it may look natural and broad and beautiful, um, there used to be a lot more flooding in the area, and now that has been curtailed. The Rio Grande cottonwoods, um, the way that they are naturally uh, regrown and, and produce themselves are through the cottonwood seed, which is a blow, and then it needs moist soils. 
to um, to be able to propagate. And with that, with the structures really hemming it in, and it not being a free flow channel with the ability to flood, we now have to take responsibility for helping this along. And even though the Bosque is really considered a natural wilderness. It really remains um, a channeled river with invisible fencing of man-made boundaries. So this is why there is a great amount of um, interaction that has to happen with the help of humans. Um, Tree New Mexico's role in partnership in this process started about 25 years ago when we were first um, when we first became a 501c3 and had our official status. It was really the first tree plantings that our organization participated in in partnership with Albuquerque Open Space. And since that time, we have planted a, a, about 32,000 cottonwoods and willows as, along with native understory trees and shrubs. As I said, our partner in this endeavor is Albuquerque Open Space, and they are the official land management agency responsible for that, that 2,500 acres of land. Uh, along with that, of course, you have the federal agencies of um, Army Corps of Engineers, the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife because of endangered species, and those, those kinds of agencies as well. Um, for our plantings, Open Space Division does the site identification and preps the area by pre-drilling the holes, bringing in the plant materials so that they're ready on site, and provides um, materials for caging for beavers and for other little critters that like to munch on, on the material after we're, we're gone. The two quote unquote climax tree species are the Rio Grande cottonwood, which um, we plant the most of, which is the deltoides with Lisney, and the Goodings black willow. And they are planted by pole method. Understory trees and shrubs, such as peach leaf willow, seep willow, or brachis, um, New Mexico olive, false indigo, wolf and serviceberry, Buffalo berry, golden currant, and others are planted by using either tall pots or long pots, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the pole plantings, though, can only be conducted in the winter spring season, usually starting around January. And uh, and but you have to quit planting as soon as it starts warming up if the poles actually bud out then the system won't work anymore. But the tall and long plots can be used year-round. So getting into pole planting. The poles are harvested usually around January, and the lengths run from about 12 to 15 feet. Um, the side branches are pruned, leaving only a few branches at the top. The poles are then bundled in groups, and then the, the butt end, the cut end, are placed in these long, large water tanks, usually like cattle troughs, to assure that, they, that the pole then starts to hydrate itself, actually suck up as much water as it possibly can. So you can imagine how heavy these can get, having that th two to three inch caliper, 15 foot pole full of water, so they can, they can be a little hard to, to transport from time to time. The planting holes, and if you can see the photo here, and I'm sorry it's a little blurred, but from now we do not plant with um, the, the truck mounted auger on site anymore. It's become too dangerous to have volunteers so close to that big equipment. So like I mentioned before, the Open Space Division goes out a few days ahead of time and actually drills all the holes before the volunteer groups get there. And then everything's on site. The planting holes are drilled using, like I mentioned, this truck-mounted auger deep enough to hit the water. And the key here is actually to make sure that there is water in that hole 
because once that pole is placed in the in the hole, the what we call the feet have to be wet. In they have to be sitting in wet soil, really wet soil. And you know, you have this 10, 15 foot pole. So even if you have to drill down five, six back filled and um, and the wires put on, you still have a five to eight foot tree sticking out of the top. The um, Once the roots start to grow and the new growth starts to appear on, on the top of the tree where you've left the branches, it happens actually pretty quickly. And we're getting about two to three feet um, of growth per, per season um, at a cost of 20, about $20. The survival rate on these uh, cottonwood and willow poles is about 85 to 90%. So it really makes it a very cost-effective method. I mean, if you think about a three-inch caliper cottonwood that you would have to buy in a nursery, it makes a lot of sense to do it this way. Plus, you don't have to worry about trying to keep it watered until you know that tree would grow out and hit the water table. Um, the other method of restoration is basically with our understory trees and shrubs is either tall pots or long, plot, long pots. And again, I mentioned those species um, previously. The tall pots, they're, they're all a square four inch by four inch pot. The tall pots are 15 inches long, deep, and the long pots are 30 inches deep. Um, if you can note the man in the corner of this photo, you will see that really long root system that he is ready to stick in that hole the minute that drill uh, is released from from the from where it's drilling. And sometimes this is really necessary to have somebody there in certain sites. We don't use volunteers for that, but um, if this particularly if the soil is really sandy, it will start to backfill pretty quickly. Um, depending on the soil, the the moisture level in the soil, um, you can use either the tall pot or the long pot. The idea here, though, with having this root system for these other types of species, is the you don't have to have the feet wet. You don't have to get down to the water table and have it, the hole start filling up with water. The idea is to get it into the capillary fringe, meaning that the soil might be very moist, but and, and we really soak these pots, um, the root balls, before we uh, plant them, that the root balls are moist and the soil is moist in the hole. And you can actually uh, plant these practically year round, although we don't try to do it in the middle of the summer. It's usually spring and fall. But um, this way, you know, they're also assured of having a developing their own system and and we do still get about an 80 to 85 percent survivability rate. These are a little bit more costly because it takes longer of course to grow them out and you're dealing with pots and soil and that and these containerized trees average about thirty dollars. So it is but the only other option that we've had in the past was using seedlings and then having to water for several years and honestly we were probably getting a survival rate of five to ten percent and it was you know very very um, labor-intensive doing it by that method. In 2001 we had a series of really bad catastrophic fires in the Bosque that summer and it really took a toll. Um, the, there are only five bridges that go that connect Albuquerque from the west side to the east side, all those bridges were closed. Um, people were evacuated. And this is one of the worst sites that you're seeing here um, called the La Aria site. It's another compelling reason why we also have to do restoration plantings and treatments. If we did not reveg this site uh, with natural native material, um, along with mechanical and chemical treatments, this area would be nothing but weeds. It would be solid weeds within a year's time. And to date, at, at, at this site alone, we have planted 
more than 8,500 trees in understory. This um, past spring, we put in another 2,000 peach leaf willow at this site um, with the help of Army Corps as well as a number of volunteers came for that one as well. Um, the other really important component that we were able to connect up with um, was the establishment of the Woodward Nursery. Before, the, before Albuquerque Open Space and Tree New Mexico established this partnership nursery in 2008 by the means of the um, Forest Service Collaborative Forest Restoration Program grant, we, were, we only had one or two sources for plant material. And that was our plant material center located just south of us in Los Lunas. New Mexico, and it's a huge center, and they they do a fantastic job. But that one center serves a seven-state region, and so the riparian material goes out to everybody, and they usually run out of material pretty early in the season if it's not being grown on contract. Um, the only other one is a very small nursery at a tribal uh, community just north of us at Santa Ana. And we do work still with both Las Lunas and with Santa Ana. But now that we have this nursery, we have our own stash of plant material to boot. Um, uh, for the entire nursery, it can hold about 8,000 um, pieces of tall plants and native trees and shrubs. And with one, about one third of those um, being ready for planted annually. Right now, this photo shows all the a lot of stuff in five gallon material, and um, there are areas where we're being able to use that as well. But it has been a huge uh, relief for the city of Albuquerque Open Space Division to be able to have this as their primary resource for plant material. Um, because we're using volunteers to do a lot of the planting. Um, maintenance and um, and watering of the nursery instead of thirty to thirty five dollars a piece for tall and long pots um, we're able to produce these at a cost of about eight dollars so it's if putting out a thousand um, in the spring and fall you know it's a real considerable savings to the city of Albuquerque um, so I'm going to wrap up with that, and uh, we can go to the question-answer period. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, for everyone who is logged in, the way we're going to do questions and answers is to have you type them in through the question and answer tab. Uh, folks have already started doing that, but just type away. We will ask them out, and then Sue will answer them. While you're started typing, I have a quick question for you, I have a lot, but the first one is um, how, uh, I guess, all of, our, all of us tree folks, we know that trees are good for water quality, but how have your projects at the Bosque helped educate uh, the, the public and volunteers in Albuquerque about th that connection between trees and water? Well, that's a good question, and um, uh, we we have a lot of information on our website. Uh, we engage the public. There are probably maybe 15 to 20 different um, days that are opportunities for people to come out. We do a, a briefing before the planting starts. Both Tree New Mexico does that and welcomes the group, and then we have the uh, biologists and, and folks from Open Space that actually give a brief talk as well. Um, the information is also on the the city's website uh, as the open as the open space divisions pages talk about this as well. And there is a lot of connection between the the city community as itself and the river. So we also have um, two main areas of recreation that are, um, you know, for the general public. One is the Rio Grande Nature Center, where it, it is more hands-on and really about the Bosque. And the other is the, the Bosque Biological Park, 
that you can come and there is signage and information all through both of those and tours are given um, by both the Rio Grande Nature Center is, and walking tours as well as at the biopark. So there are plenty of opportunities for community members as well as visitors to learn about the Bosque and the connection between um, the river and water and trees, which we're really thrilled about having. I mean, the situation that we have is unique to Albuquerque, and there really is no other city that can that has it in the way that we do. Um, so it's 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 quite a feature of Albuquerque, and as you can see from the first photo, when you fly in, the first thing you will see is that green belt that runs through the middle of town. It's you know phenomenal, and it's part of everybody's daily life. Great. So uh, a lot of questions coming in about uh, invasives. Can you speak a little bit about controlling invasive species? And um, you know how many of the sites you're you're working on are sort of free invasives, or how are you scheduling plantings versus removal of invasives? You're never free of invasives, unfortunately, <laughs> and uh, it is a, a really big problem. And and unfortunately, more resources go to invasive species and control than actually restoration just because of the numbers. But the trees are usually taken out either by, um, by open space division itself or we, we are lucky here, we have what is called the New Mexico State Forestry Inmate Work Camp, which is minimum security people are trained at the, at the facility and uh, that work crew can be contracted with at a very low price compared to what a private sector would be and um, they come in and do a lot of clearing both of tree species and of weeds. Of course um, they try to keep any chemical uh, applications as to, the, to a minimum and those are handled strictly by open space uh, personnel that are you know licensed and, and stuff in, in using those chemicals. But it is a continual problem and that we deal with every year. And uh, as sites are, are cleared, they, they are given a regular, they're monitored and you know, taken care of regularly. Great. Uh, also a lot of questions about uh, sort of your digging for the, the poles. Um, uh -huh. Some questions about why, about how to reach, how you do it when you can't use the, um, auger because you can't the truck mounted auger can't get into a certain you know a more remote location or you know why use such a large auger to drill the hole maybe could you use a, a bar or a dibble stick um, and also a question about using the auger in a wet soil do you run into issues with sort of glazing the sides of the planting hole to the point where it inhibits root growth so maybe if you could just speak a little bit about the, the process of digging the holes for the pole planting well, the truck mounted auger is the most successful uh, method, although we do use um, hand augers uh, as well as uh, both mechanical and you know manpower augers, big ones. Um, but th th it just takes forever to to do it um, manually. Uh, we have had very little problem with any kind of glazing. We don't have those kind of soils. Usually they're sandier rather than um, harder and uh, and just the natural flow of the water the underground water it it makes it so that it's it doesn't usually inhibit it like I said we're getting um, you know around a 90 percent survival rate so those factors are always sort of checked but um, you do have to get down in there and so using a smaller uh, piece of equipment like a dibble stick or whatever um, and you want it big enough so that there is loose soil um, going back down into the hole when you backfill so even though you may have a three inch caliper tree if you're using this 12 inch drill there's enough loose soil loose moist soil that goes back down in that hole and tamped in that it still is plenty of, of room now the the roots really don't start growing out the sides until later. At first they go down, 
then they start coming out of the sides of it um, toward the end of the first year and uh, that has uh, not really been an issue for us. And also with, with the truck auger, you, you haven't seen any problem with uh, soil compaction from the weight of the truck? Uh, no, not really. And um, th they're in and out of there pretty easy, pretty quickly. Now the trees are not planted close together either. You know, there's probably a good 12 to 15 feet where um, in between the trees is there, we try to plant them sort of in a natural grove uh, uh, way so that they're not just lined up. So the, the truck is in and out of there and really doesn't cause the kind of compaction that would inhibit um, any kind of tree growth. Excellent. Uh, some folks are interested just in, in the cottonwood poles in general. If you don't have a good source for poles, can you use the top branches of cottonwood? You can use the top branches of, of cottonwood. The way that these are usually, I, I could have been doing this for like an hour or two hours, but <laughs> the general way is is that the, the cottonwood tree is allowed to grow to about 15 feet and then it is cut off at about a two to three foot um, length or height. And then it takes a, a, a couple of years for the suckers to come up that are running around t 10 to 15 feet and those are the ones that are usually cut and then used as poles. Um, th that method, because it's a younger um, plant than using the top branches of an older tree, are usually more successful in cottonwood pole planting. Great. Uh, good question now about uh, sort of the impact you've seen and whether the water quality or quantity has been monitored to assess the sort of impact of your efforts. Yes, there's a group called um, BEMP, B-E-M-P, um, Bosque Environmental Monitoring Program. And it is run by the University of New Mexico as well as a high school here called Bosque Prep. And um, they have monitoring uh, stations, uh, about 15 of them within this 22-mile uh, stretch of the Rio Grande that are checked and um, used, uh, that information is used annually to check water flow and water depth and all of that. We have such a significant problem though with damming and all of this that there is, you know, there's a huge upset to exactly how much water comes in to the Rio Grande at this point and um, whatever that it is hard to really determine what what effect the plant material has versus what's really happening um, with all of those you know artificial structures and um, the idea though is to keep enough water we know that we have to keep enough water in that 22 miles to make sure that the banks of the Rio Grande and this Cottonwood Willow Gallery has enough water to um, to sustain itself. Now there has been some people that keep coming up with the idea just to clear out all the vegetation we'd have more water and we know that that is not the way to go. So um, in, in short we are doing the best we can to keep that monitored and to keep a healthy balance. Great. One, I think probably one final question that has to do with um, predators. It's specifically asking about beaver predation on newly planted trees, but maybe if you can just tell us more generally about your, your tactics and techniques for dealing with beavers, and I think you mentioned deer and, and other wildlife that like to graze on baby trees or newly planted trees. Well, I did put it in here, and maybe I, uh, in, the, in the text, that all all the pole plants that we install are, we do cage them for beavers. We never see a beaver. I mean, they're practically invisible. However, the minute newly planted trees are put in, beavers appear. So everything <laughs> is caged um, and, and, it's, and those are checked um, regularly. And if we need to, we put a second cage on after the tree has grown considerably just to make sure. But um, but in general, yeah. And then of course we have rabbits. We do not have deer in this area, 
but we we do have rabbits and other little creatures that love to munch on them and sometimes the little ones get in there but they don't usually cause enough damage to really harm the tree it's really the beavers that we're caging it for excellent that is great we have uh, more questions than we can get to now but uh, I think some of them are going to apply um, to Chuck's presentation as well so we might be able to ask them a little bit later on thank you Terrific. so much Sue really appreciate your time this afternoon thank you next up we have Chuck Connor who is an urban forester with the Missouri Department of Conservation in Kansas City Chuck is extremely experienced in the field of urban forestry and has worked for the forestry departments at several universities. He has 10 years experience in the landscaping industry and is an ISA certified arborist and municipal specialist. Chuck is really knowledgeable about the state of watersheds in the Kansas City area with a wide range of experience working there and we're very excited to have him with us today to tap into this experience and tell us about establishing urban riparian buffers in Kansas City. Thanks so much for being with us today, Chuck. Let's make sure we have you on the line, and you should be good to go. Are we with you, Chuck? Uh, can I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? We hear you. Wonderful, but I don't have control of the mouse, Leland. Let, we're going to give it to you right now. All right, you got it. I don't have it. <laughs> it. Takes a couple seconds, but you should get it. Well, if it doesn't seem to be working, uh, why don't we get started, and uh, you can tell us when to switch the slides, and we'll move them for you. Great. Well, why don't we start by moving the slide once for me? As Leland said, I'm Chuck Connor. I'm an urban forester with the Missouri Department of Conservation, and I help take care of the Kansas City metropolitan area. And I just want to start real quick, and I'm probably speaking to the choir here, that riparian trees are important for healthy urban watersheds, but it is not going to solve all the problems we have in urbanized riparian ecosystems now. You, you really have to make sure if you're a city forester that your city has a very good stream setback ordinance in place that's enforced that, so you can have land to actually establish these buffers in. And we're not going to have healthy streams until we, we decide we're going to develop and address stormwater issues on site instead of building bigger pipes. Um, what you're seeing in the slide here, a riparian buffer can slow down the erosion and 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 slow this, but this is never going to become a, a healthy urban watershed unless um, some huge changes are made both up and downstream of this point. Uh, next slide, please. Hello, great, and again. You know, this is a no-win situation. If we're going to have development practices such as this, we're, uh, I mean, we can try our best, but what are you going to do when given the situation like this? How, how do you retrofit this? And I, I don't really have these answers. I just know we're causing our own worst problems in a lot of that. But we're here to, today to talk about establishing urban wooded buffers. And I have the mouse now, I think, Leland, but I'm not getting a uh, a arrow. You should be able to see that. Okay. Wonderful. We're here to discuss uh, planting wooded riparian buffers. And in the Kansas City metro area, which is a two-state area of Kansas and Missouri, on our side of the state line, we have three players, and that's our nonprofit tree organization, Heartland Tree Alliance, which is a program of bridging the gap our environmental nonprofit umbrella organization in the metro area, the local municipalities, and the Missouri Department of Conservation. I am not getting a slide advance. There we go. Can you go back one? There we go. Harlan Tree Alliance. Um, uh, helps, they supply volunteers for these plantings. 
the volunteer service uh, manager posts the riparian planning opportunities on a variety of external websites. They include Volunteer Match, Bridging the Gap Zone website, and a few others. And they also send quarterly updates to volunteer groups, and that seems to be very popular to have corporate work days and come out and spend some time uh, working with coworkers in the outdoors and, and just building relationships. It, it, it works really well, and a lot of corporations are wanting to do that now. Uh, to learn more about Heartland Tree Alliance, uh, just that's their website up top. And... Um, what they do is when they get a, a, a corporate group or Heartland Tree Alliance has a tree keepers program, which is a six weeks course, kind of a citizen planning, pruning uh, training course that has uh, trained volunteers. When they show up on site, they sign liability waivers. Heartland Tree Alliance has insurance to cover the volunteers for. They provide snacks and water at most sites and they act as a point of contact for information and questions concerning the event from the volunteers. So the volunteers don't call me or the municipality. They, they call uh, Heartland Tree Alliance. And before I move on to the other partners in this, I would just like to give a shout out to the Bridging Gap Program Coordinator and Heartland Tree Alliance Program Manager. Uh, Noelle Morris does a fantastic job and uh, she's a pleasure to work with. So. They are, they are one of the premier organizations in this area. So here's what it looks like on just an average riparian planning day. Uh, you've got members from uh, the city of Raytown Park and Rec Department here, the, the Missouri Department of Conservation. There's several urban foresters here, a private land conservationist and a uh, community conservation planner from the Department of Conservation. You've got some tree keeper volunteers, Noel Morris, the director of Heartland Tree Alliance's program manager. And then you've also got a corporate group, that's our uh, utility, Kansas City Power and Light, that came out and put this in for volunteer work. So that's our nonprofit. They bring in the volunteers. Our municipalities locate and provide the sites to plant. They've been usually between one and three acres in size. Then they'll perform the necessary site preparation before we plant. They'll inform their citizens in the community, especially those who have properties that abut these projects of what's going on. They provide staff on the day of planning and that's, they're there to, they, they help us plant the seedlings, but, but they're primarily there to answer citizen questions. If we have some citizens show up on the, on the day of the planning and, and uh, want to know what's going on and just so they know that we have the city's buy-in on these. And then they'll maintain the buffers also after, after we finish with these planning events. There we go. Uh, and then the Missouri Div Department of Conservation, I provide technical input and train the volunteers on the proper way to plant these seedlings. I also, I usually select the seedlings that are going in. We have a wonderful state nursery that provides me the seedlings we need for these riparian plantings at, at no cost. And then I also get the cover crop seed for them. And if they need uh, herbicides for site preparation, I, I can help su supply those to them. Our uh, state nursery provides millions of seedlings for both uh, reforestation on public lands and we sell them at a very good cost to the public for reforesting our own uh, private lands in the state of Missouri. And I'd like to shout out to George Clark and the state nursery guys down there. They do a fantastic job for us. So those are the three. The, the three partnerships, the, non, the nonprofit that provides volunteers, the city who provides staff and, and a riparian zone to plant, and me and the Department of Conservation that provide the materials and the technical know-how. Site preparation depends on what it's in already. Most of ours, uh, we are converting mode fescue back into uh, riparian buffers. We have done one crop field conversion, but again, most of it has been mode fescue. We plan in the spring. Our nursery only lifts during the winter time, so the trees aren't available for fall planting. So we do spring planting. 
what we'll usually do is have the uh, municipality mow the turf about a month before we plant. And as soon as that fescue greens up, we'll hit it with glyphosate. Wait at least two weeks. Uh, three is, seems to be even better. And then we'll hit it again with glyphosate and then plant any time after that. Uh, for everyone, when you're using herbicides, make sure you know use your head, read the label, and watch weather forecasts when you're spraying. On the crop field conversions, uh, our big problem around here with crop fields, is, especially if they've been fallow or have flooded recently, is Johnson grass. And you really need to make sure pre-planting and during the first few growing seasons that you control that. Uh, you can control it with uh, glyphosate pre-planting and then um, um, afterwards they do make a very good over-the-top herbicides that, that are grass specific that you can control that. But that seems to be our, our, our biggest weed problem when we're doing crop field conversions in, in our area at least is the Johnson grass. Uh, we have a, a, a rather large plant palette that the state nursery can provide me with. I, I like, uh, uh, depending on where it is and how often it floods out, it, it will depend on what exactly I use. I, I try to keep um, no more than 20% in any one genus when I put these in. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about oaks or Quercus a little while later and the problems we have with that. But we got a pretty good palette and uh, everything from shrubs, your black chokeberry and elderberry, nine bark, button, button bush, up to your, uh, your larger plants, your silver maples, river birch, bur oak, swamp white oak. Uh, Kentucky coffee tree I really like. It, uh, it seems to get uh, deer browse the least on, on these. So. For planting densities, I'm putting in a minimum of 450 trees per acre. I've got a, a GPS and I always walk around either that or I get on ARC and, and see what kind of uh, space I'm looking at and how much area and then choose accordingly to uh, over 900 trees an acre and especially on urbanized areas, with the more urbanized they are, I tend to go up. In fact, I've, I've even put them in over 1,000 trees per acre. Um, just we seem to get a, a huge population of white-tailed deer and, and I really go up on that. I'm striving for a three-year survival count of 200 or more per acre. I seem to be getting that. Uh, I increase the number as uh, severity of flooding increases and again I'll talk about this a little later. I'm trying to get oak on site and I'm observing natural regeneration occurring on most of those sites too. Now the natural regeneration is more of the soft mass species. I get box elder coming up, silver maple, uh, red elm, honey locust, cottonwood, sycamore, and willow. Maybe not the best species that I'd want there, but it's, uh, you know, when you, when you had mowed fescue, I'll take those species anytime and they are, you know, native buffers. So the volunteers we get are excellent. They show up with smiles and they do, they do a great job. We usually get somewhere around 20 to 25 volunteers for each one of these events and they average about 500 seedlings planted in the ground per hour. Or if you break that down per person, about 20 seedlings per person per hour. We are using dibble bars and um, we'll bring out a couple hodads too sometimes, but we're planting 1-0 uh, seedlings bare root and then we also have uh, sandbar willow cuttings and cottonwood cuttings are cuttings we're using. Sandbar willow is a clump forming willow and uh, those cuttings are coming in around 12 to 18 inches long and we use rubber mallets if the ground's um, harder. If you can't push them in yourself, we, we pound them in with rubber mallets and I usually try to put those up right next to the stream bank. and. Um, uh, like the uh, presentation before me, those you're pounding in as far as you can go. You, it's nice to get only the top two inches showing above the ground and, and sink them 10, 12 inches in the ground. Uh, if you want to get more work done, do it in colder temperatures. Um, people like to work to stay warm. We did a planting this spring where it was honestly 34 degrees and raining on us. This is a photo from that. 
the volunteers smiled all day and and we got a thousand trees planted in the ground in under two hours. Uh, it seems that as the temperature goes up, your your productivity goes down. You, you need water breaks. So if you want to get some work done, <laughs> plan in a cold, wet rain. My biggest three challenges, what I consider in my area or establishment challenges, I'm going to go over what I think they are and, and how we're trying to mitigate these challenges. The number one concern, a lot of these urban riparian zones, they are houses back up to them. They've been mowed in the past. It's fescue, and they bought these houses thinking they've got a mowed manicure park in the back, which they have. But they don't realize if they don't do something sooner or later, their their entire house is going to be in the stream bed. And it's 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 an aesthetic mind shift that these homeowners have to do that they, instead of having a mowed manicure park, they needed a wooded riparian buffer. And you have to get them past that manicured look. And one of the ways we've done that seems to work out really well is to get, if you want, some larger stock and put that towards the front of the your planting. Use like three to five gallon pots and, and fast growing species like sycamore to get you some first day flash. And, uh, but the big one I've been putting in is instead of using a traditional cover crop, if you've got neighbors that are close to seedling plantings, I put in what I call some flash annuals. And what I'm using is black-eyed Susans and prairie coreopsis. These are native prairie wildflowers to our area. They flower the first season they're planted. If you plant them early spring, they flower that summer. So when they're looking at these out over these small seedling plantings, where when you're 50 feet away, it's difficult to see these seedlings, the this gives them a show, especially that first year during the conversion where they really have to get used to it. This can really make that pop and make it more palatable to these homeowners where, you know, you're going to have to wait on a riparian tree planting to, to develop into a riparian tree planting. And this gives you something to give them, get them through that first year where, where you've changed from mowing it and having more lawn, basically, into a more native environment. And, and this has worked rather well for me. Um, I, I try to put down about 10 pounds per acre, and I do it much heavier in the first 20 feet of the, of the uh, killed-off fescue because that's what they're primarily going to see. So that's how we've tried to get over the, you're no longer mowing my backyard. Invasive species in our region, like I said again, is you, especially on uh, old crop field conversions, you've got to control Johnson grass. Even when you've done a, uh, a um, turf grass conversion, if you get flooding in a riparian buffer, you're going to get it, Johnson grass come in in a seedling or as seed. And you, and you need to kind of walk those once every year or so and, and either spray with Roundup or an over-the-top grass-specific herbicide to, to keep that under control. And then my third establishment challenge, and I don't have an answer. What, could we go back one, please? There you go. There we go. And, and I, I'd love if anyone does have a, an answer for this. In, in our urban areas, most of them have a very high uh, white-tailed deer population, and we get unbelievable pressure from browse sometimes on those, especially on oak species. And uh, what I do is just to make sure that I get enough seedlings per acre survivability past that three-year establishment phase, is when I'm including oaks into the plantings, and I always include oaks into the planting because I'm always hoping I can get some through establishment, but I'm planning on a 0% survivability for every oak I put in there. So let's say I want to plant 1,000 trees per acre, and I'm going to put 200 different oaks in there. Well, I'm going to plant 1,200 seedlings because I'm automatically counting those 200 oaks out. 
Um, I, I have no idea what to do on this. Um, even in non-riparian zones, I manage four urban conservation areas, two as part of my job, and when you go through the end of your story, oak, generation, oak regeneration is non-existent. The, the deer populations on these urbanized areas are all so high that, that there's just nothing there. I don't have an answer for this other than to build giant domes over these. If anyone does have something that's working, if you could address that during the question and answer time, I would I would love to hear that. But I, again, boy, I, I do not have an answer to this one. And with that, I would like to just thank you for this opportunity. Again, I'd like to thank Heartland Tree Alliance and Noel Morris there. And I'd also most importantly like to thank the citizens of the state of Missouri who make this possible through their support in conservation. And with that, I'd love to take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chuck. And uh, also thank you with, with your point about Oaks. Thank you for sort of continuing and facilitating this conversation. That's the goal for our webcasts is to get a lot of ideas out here and get people talking more about what we can do for trees and watershed health. So again, everyone, it's question and answer time. If you have a question, please type it in through the control panel that you see and we will ask it. We've got a lot already, so we'll get going. Uh, this is a question that um, uh, probably applies to both of you, but Chuck, tell us, how do you identify, um, or do you know how the city identifies um, spaces or areas within their cities where they want to do plantings? A lot you, of our are plant they prioritizing for factors like, um, you know, uh, fish, you know, uh, cooling temperatures for fish or other other reasons that they might prioritize certain areas. Well, they're they're pri prioritizing the areas. Most of our planning are are occurring in linear parks that were established as a buffer for these streams. But again, it was. It was mowed when they established the park. It was old fescue pasture. They started to mow them and got into this maintenance phase, you know, where they're just mowing turf. And especially now, the the one of as people become more informed on conservation, they, they're realizing the importance of of wooded buffers. But a lot of the driving force behind this, to to be honest with you is $4 gas and the price of mowing this fescue. It, it's a, uh, uh, when, when, when taxpayers see what, uh, what these uh, park departments are, are spending on mowing and keeping this in a manicured position and, and then compare that with less, not no, but less maintenance of converting into riparian and the ecological benefits those wooded riparian buffers have, that's where we're getting these conversions coming from. Got it. Uh, just to share some of the thoughts that people are mentioning about the oaks, um, using four foot tree protectors just for the oaks is one thought. And another suggestion was um, using unpalatable nursery trees or shrubs to surround the oaks. Um, I, well, I, I know from personal experience, you can surround oaks with anything unpalatable and the deer are going to find your oaks. That's what, <laughs> and just, uh, I know this is recorded, so if you want to go back and look at that species list of what I use, uh, one of the better species I found for uh, avoiding or un being unpalatable to deer are the Kentucky coffee tree. They will browse those, but it's more of a last resort type of thing. I've had pretty good luck with that, and that's I, I enjoy that tree species. So, But I, I'm having a devil, devil of a time with trying to get Quercus in these plantings, in any urban plantings for that matter. A lot of people are recommending uh, tree protectors and tubes, but I want to move on and ask you uh, about some of the cover crops you mentioned. Have you noticed if any of the temporary fast-growing cover crops um, outcompete the smaller, slower-growing new plant material? Not, not really. And, and both black-eyed Susan and Plains Coreopsis in general the black-eyed Susan stays shorter than those 1-0 seedlings we're putting in, so they're not overtopping it. They grow upright, 
And the Plains Coreopsis, for those unfamiliar with that plant, it has a very, um, I would say, willowy open appearance where it, it's not a shade caster. If it was a tree, it'd be a honey locust, very dappled light shade. And again, it will grow fast enough in that first year. It can get about three feet tall where it will kind of come up and maybe overtop them a little bit, but a lot of sunlight passes through those. And uh, and and I I honestly think on getting it to appear aesthetically more pleasing to get those homeowner buy-ins. So like I say, the challenge you have is when you convert what used to be a mowed parkland to these, they look rough for several years. And if you don't do something where they can see something at least halfway pretty, you start to get a pushback from these homeowners to their elected officials and the plantings end up becoming mowed after a year or two and converted back to fescue. So even if I do lose some of these trees through competition to a pretty cover crop, I'm still going to do that because I'm trying to get more buy-in from the, from the people whose properties these abut. Great. I have, uh, I think, probably one or two final questions for you before we wrap up. And, and Sue, also feel free to chime in here. But um, a good question about whether uh, planning for climate change and uh, what, what that will mean for your species has impacted your choice of what, what types of trees, what species of trees to use in your work. Well, uh, I'll, I'll address that first, if you don't mind, Chuck. But, um, you know, I'm a little jealous of Chuck because he has a much broader palette to choose from. So his choices, um, you know, he has more choice than what we do. We have a very limited palette, and the kinds of trees and understory that I mentioned are pretty much it. So, um, of course, having those climax trees, the larger trees, the cottonwoods and the black willow, um, are obviously going to do more good when it comes to climate change, but um, but our palate is our palate, really. And as far for as me, I, I'm uh, I'm addressing what I can control, and what I can control right now is what plants grow in my sites today. I would. I figure as climate change occurs, we can get migration of trees naturally into these stands as, as the ones who can't take that change in temperature migrate out of it. Right now, I'm looking for something that will establish quick, do well, and form a, can a canopy over these and, and, and reduce that weed competition then. I, I'm much more worried about a quick establishment than climate change. Excellent. Uh, there are a lot more questions that people have and also a lot of suggestions about uh, how to handle deer, a lot of them having to do with finding somebody with a rifle to get out there. But uh, <laughs> we uh, want to keep this to our one hour, so we are going to wrap it up here. We will uh, make sure that people can ask their questions of you uh, through contact information, and we will work to get answers to the unanswered questions so far and make that available as well. I want to thank everyone for listening in today and joining us on our webcast. Uh, we would love for you to take a few minutes right now to answer the survey that comes up at the end of uh, this session. That will help us make sure that we're programming topics that you want to learn about and for everyone who fills out the survey, we will send you the recording of this session along with an, a related resource list um, in about one week. So please take a few minutes for that. At the same time, we want you to register for our next session, which is going to be on working with sports teams to plant trees. And that's going to be in July on the third Thursday, as always. A big thank you today to everyone who participated and to our two presenters, Sue Probart and Chuck Connor. We really appreciate your uh, insight. It, there's a lot more to be said about this topic. Uh, wonderful to hear how your two organizations are so successfully 
uh, planting trees in riparian areas for watershed health. Thanks so much for joining us today, everyone.